I had one incredible opportunity in 1980 when a fisherman called me and told me he had a live great white shark. He named her Sandy. She was seven and a half feet long and 350 pounds and caught in his net. He was a very wise fisherman and kept it alive long enough for us to drive to it, obtain her, put her in our truck and drive her back to the aquarium. Well, of course, after all we'd been through, after all these years, the last thing I was going to do was risk the shark's life by watching it swim on its own. I had to be in there with it in case it needed help. Looking back at it, it was pretty foolish because no one had ever done this before. And I guess in a calm moment, if asked, would I jump in the water with a great white shark? I'd say, of course not. That would be nuts. That would be crazy. I was in a circular aquarium, and the shark was swimming around the circle soon to catch up with me. I lay on the bottom as flat as I could, and the shark swam right over my head. At first, we were very nervous about being in the tank with her when the light level was low. But we felt so confident after swimming all day with her that she wouldn't attack us. And she didn't attack us. As the shark became healthier and healthier, it began to show some very aberrant behavior. The first thing we noted was the difficulty that it had with a small portion of the aquarium. It's circular in shape, but there was a five degree arc that we later measured that was difficult for the shark to swim by. She would swim towards it, sometimes do a 180 degree turn, sometimes collide rather strongly with that smooth portion of the wall. The second day she swam faster, collided more often. And by the third day, we tried to feed her. We put blood in the water. We added a variety of food items to the water, hoping that the other fishes would feed in the tank and that she would get the message from them. But she didn't feed. She was confused. Something relating to her feeding behavior was apparently linked to her collisions with a wall. Finally, we excluded all the possibilities. That was light levels, vibrations, sound, and we're left with electricity we brought in an electronics engineer. The concrete tank with stainless steel window frames apparently was corroding. There was a weak electrolysis phenomenon going on that within that five degree arc made an electric hotspot. And this electric hotspot, as weak as it was, was very attractive to the shark. We asked the electrician, what could we do to ground it to stop this electrical phenomenon? He said nothing. We must let the water out of the tank and repair it. Well, that leak was obviously responsible for its collisions and most probably responsible for its inability to feed. We thought about it and said, there's nothing we can do in terms of the long-term captivity of the shark. We can't fix the tank. We can't keep the shark anywhere else. We have no choice other than to let it go or to die in the aquarium. The response in San Francisco was immediate and phenomenal. People said, Keep it alive, do everything you can, keep that shark alive. And as the shark got weaker after colliding with the tank, people said, let it go. People even came to us and said, we know it's a killer, but let it go, let it live. We did that, we put her on a boat and took her to the Farallon Islands. With tears in her eyes, we sadly put her in the water and said goodbye to her, she swam away. And we all hoped that someday she would return and be back in the Steinhardt Aquarium. <laughs>